Ignorance is the definition of doing something or the same thing over and over again and expecting different results or something like that. But my stepfather used to say it to me all the time, you know, he used to say to me like, if this isn't working for you and you keep meeting the same issue over and over again, maybe you look at changing your approach. Hello and welcome to another vlog on YouTube and podcast on Spotify by the Fit Minds podcast. Your host, Coach Mariah here. So today we're going to chat about how to avoid burnout, how to avoid spiraling downward with what could be deemed as a hidden form of self-sabotage. Um, and the reason why it's hidden is because most people who seem like they're busy or they're hustling or you know they're pushing as hard as possible are not perceived to be people who are trying to sabotage themselves. And you know, for the most part, you probably aren't trying to do that, at least not purposefully. But in some way, yes, burning out is a form of self-sabotage. So what are the signs of burnout? Fatigue, irritability, forgetfulness, double booking, no time for your loved ones, a social life, let alone yourself, resenting your work, personal, family, passion or career commitments, social withdrawal, uh, making mistakes, hurting yourself, having accidents, poor concentration or coordination or both, getting sick often, injuring yourself often in the gym, stomach upset, headaches, shaking hands, loss of appetite and weakness, feeling overwhelmed, stressed, exhausted, fed up, avoidant, defeated, frustrated, isolated, anxious, conflicted, uh, trapped, fear of, uh, uh, fear of failure is quite common with um, uh, burnout, self-doubt and imposter syndrome. So some examples of habits or lifestyle choices which may be contributing greatly to your burnout will include Taking on too many personal and career commitments, maybe a new hobby, multiple projects at a time, committing to drastically clashing goals or aspirations, often counterproductive to one another, not exercising enough, neglecting physical activity altogether, or often exercising too much, for example, seven times weekly with no rest days, doing double sessions, you know, runs in the morning and gym sessions at night for no actual apparent reason. Not taking downtime, alone time, or time to do simply nothing, to look after yourself or engage in enjoyable non-career or study related activities. Avoiding nutrition and water requirements due to perceived lack of time or stress levels, not prioritizing your personal health altogether. Uh, trying to be the guy or girl to do it all, okay? So full-time study, full-time work, launch a business, juggle family commitments, comp prep, travel, get enough sleep and exercise and lose weight and don't forget to pick up the kids from school. <laughs> Piling too much on your plate, whether it be in a day, week, month, or year. Setting unrealistic expectations for yourself and never being quite satisfied with what you've accomplished. Modeling your life off the lives of others or comparing your accomplishments to others. Buying into the hustle culture, okay? It's actually probably more pre prevalent on social media is this hustle culture. Believing that in any case, more is always more. Not accepting or asking for help or support not acknowledging or believing, there are more effective ways of operating and perceiving that you are stuck this way. Your perception of what's required to achieve success and what success and hard work should look like versus what it actually needs to look like. Having a to-do list which is endless and has no real order of priority, not scheduling tasks or structuring your days, weeks, months and years accordingly. Having an all-in or black and white attitude towards your goals, career and or finances, speaking about yourself critically, constantly, and not ever praising yourself for sorts for small accomplishments or praising yourself at all. Poor self-reflection, poor boundaries with others and an inability to say no to more work or even yes for relaxation or downtime. Not putting aside time for self-care, health, sleep and doing things that you actually enjoy. So it doesn't sound very enjoyable, does it? Your life doesn't seem like it has much purpose if the only purpose is to grind until you die. Creating structure and routine is the first step, the first step to avoiding burnout. Obviously identifying, you know, we've seen that, all of the signs of, of heading towards burnout or maybe you've already hit that point. But creating structure and routine is something I've spoken about quite often in previous podcasts. It's mastering the art of having a plan, something that you can go by that basically stops you from feeling scattered all the time. 
an efficient routine that will work for you. But it won't work for you if it is something that is simply a thought process in your mind, but not something that you've written down or even have a record of. So it's all good and well to have a routine up here, but it's absolutely terrible for execution. Um, as human beings, we need reminders. Don't think that you are the person who is immune to that. Um, ensuring that your days, weeks, months and years have structure and regular routine is incredibly important for executing your goals and aspirations effectively and obviously as stress-free as possible. How many times have you set a goal for yourself and not written it down? Yeah, whether it be financial, career or personal and strangely but not coincidentally, subsequently not even achieve that goal. Um, maybe you still haven't. Oftentimes we make a promise to ourselves and in our heads that we are going to, for example, do something as simple as a grocery shop or our meal prep um, or even half an hour of study or reading once a day. But then there is no action to follow suit. Most of the time this is going to be because we've not set ourselves a reminder, written the commitment down and even so um, used a system that works for us, for example. In a way that reminds us in an obvious place that we can't possibly avoid it. Another mistake I've seen with creating structure and routine is that some people will commit to far too much in a day, week or even months, often wondering why they simply can't fit it all in. As I said in previous podcasts, we often hear the line, I don't have time. And usually this is because most people are spending more time on other tasks, which are simply, well, a waste of time. Things like time on social media, time having a conversation that has gone on longer than it needs to, uh, not putting up boundaries and allowing people to take up our time more than we probably should, attending events that we don't want to go to, watching TV shows on Netflix to switch off. Uh, there are a couple of tips that I would give to somebody who is feeling burnt out and currently um, doesn't have a solid structure or routine. You should treat your structure and routine like a skeleton where you start out with the basics and uh, that are required to fill your week at a bare minimum. So what are the things you know that you need to do every single week? And then you can slot the variable factors in around that. Things like preparing your meals in advance, which we know is synonymous for success with nutrition. Um, you'll start your start times for your career, work or business, time blocking certain tasks and breaking up a project across say days, weeks and months, knowing how many hours that you will need to contribute and perhaps even pick um, particular days that you will need to do so repeatedly. So I do my washing on the same day each week. I use that as an example because it's something very simple. Um, auditing your time, okay? People are really self-conscious about doing this. Um, I did a time audit years ago and it really dawned upon me how much time I was spending communicating and I loved communicating with clients, but it was taking up my entire days where I could possibly time block and have particular times that I reply and then obviously particular times I do other um, tasks or I get other things done. So you might think that it's time consuming to audit your time and to keep a time diary of what you've done for the day, but it is something that I, I have done before, as I mentioned, and it really has changed the way that I view my time, uh, how much I value my time and my productivity levels. Keeping a diary of exactly the tasks that you are completing throughout the day, how long it takes you to complete them and how long you are spending on particular tasks more than others. Then figure out which ones are taking you the longest and whether or not they are, necess they are necessary or they can be simplified simplified, reduced, or even removed altogether. No matter how you form your structure and routine, it's most important that the format works for you. So for some people, they want to use a calendar on their phone and post-it notes. Others might want to use notes in their phone and a whiteboard in their office. There is no particular way that you need to facilitate a plan, okay? But as long as the plan constantly reminds you of where you need to be and um, the structure and routine is working for you. If it isn't, you're going to have to reassess and try again. There is nothing more important in life for your success and efficiency than creating a solid structure and routine first to base your 24 hours, your week or your month off of. Especially when applying a structure and routine to an endeavor that you want to succeed in. This will apply to your career, your study, your personal commitments, house chores and even long-term projects. After your structure and routine has been established, it is important that you create a sound amount of repetition and as much consistency as possible to facilitate completion and ease of the functionality, okay? So imagine your life like a fine-tuned machine. Now, you're not a machine, but if you can plan for as much as possible, it means that when there are things thrown at you in life that you don't feel as overwhelmed because you are ticking things off as you go. It's something that you already have written down and those little interruptions aren't going to be as dramatic. So 
The next point would be assessing your strategy, your why. Question, the question you must ask yourself is, why am I doing this? So of all the tasks, of all the projects that you've got going at the moment, for example, I'm at the moment studying full time. It's a necessity. It's compulsory. I can't get around it. Um, I have a full time business. That's necessary. I can't, I can't get around that either unless someone runs it for me. And I'm also pregnant. Can't get around that. I will be pregnant until I have the baby. Um, other commitments include I've got a comp prep course that I'm finishing for uh, insurance purposes. Again, it's compulsory. I can't get around that. So see how this type of stuff is definitely non-negotiable. Can't get around it. Um, but then I'm not piling more on my plate. I do have to move house in a couple of months. I know that that's coming up. So I'm going to prepare in advance for that around the December period. I know there's a couple of birthdays coming up for myself and my partner. And then we've got the baby being born in March next year. So I've already got all of those dates all laid out in my diary, in my calendar, um, a few months in advance to kind of look at things and go, you know what, I probably can't take something on in this month that's too heavy and knowing my limits and understanding them and, and putting that into place well beforehand. But I have to know my why behind what I'm doing before I commit to it. And if it's not that strong, I probably don't really want to go down that path. And sometimes you can look at delaying that as well. So the questions are, why did I commit to this? Where am I going with this? Sometimes this can evoke the answers behind your actual end goal and purpose. And sometimes you need to give it a rating out of 10. You know, how badly do I want to finish this? How badly do I want this? You know, is this for intrinsic motivation or is it an extrinsically motivated um, task or job or project? You know, am I doing it for myself or is it for other people? And that can sometimes clear that up. If there is no particular reason why you're doing something like if you really think about it I'm just doing it because I was I started and, and I want to finish it you've got to ask yourself why do you want to continue to pursue the endeavor if it's only consuming your val valuable time and stressing you out and the interesting thing too is that we have found that um, people get addicted to stress yes stress is an addiction despite it obviously not being that enjoyable people get addicted to feeling stressed and sometimes they will actually put themselves in a position where they are more stressed just because it continues that kick for them. In life, we often normalize the idea of starting something new and exciting, but sometimes we don't normalize the idea of finishing or discarding something if it is not working well for us or is productive or enjoyable for us. As we do this, sorry, as we see this as a failure, okay, instead of a move in the direction of where we actually want to be, focusing on what we actually want to be focusing on. Um, unfortunately, as a result, we end up with multiple projects on the go, a whole lot of stress and not a lot of, whole, not a lot of uh, time to ourselves or our loved ones. Mostly because of the fear of failure and giving up on a pursuit in which we had invested time into. So um, good podcast for you to listen to if you have trouble of letting go is the letting go podcast I did. And also the sunken cost fallacy, uh, sunk cost fallacy, which talks about, um, you know, being able to move on from something just because you've invested time in it, it doesn't mean you need to keep going with it. So it's, there's no coincidence. Again, I say in every podcast, all of these principles work together. Um, Oftentimes when approaching clients about a topic of burnout and stress, it seems to me that their current life choices and lifestyle is simply not working for them. And yet for some reason, they believe that they are stuck this way. This is the way my life is. I'm stuck here. I can't change my career. I can't change this. I can't change that. And that's it. You know, it's like, it's like they, that they're a chess piece and they've glued themselves to the board. And um, sometimes it can be helpful to introduce an outsider to assess whether or not your current commitments might be a little bit too heavy for achieving any one of those commitments successfully. And if you've ever read, read a book, there's a really good book called, one of my clients referred it on to me actually, called The One Thing. And it talks about how successful businesses and business people across time have actually focused on one thing at a time, doing it very well. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes it's multifaceted. You know, projects are going to be multifaceted. But doing one thing at a time really well instead of multiple different things poorly. Um... As, as, and I said as well in previous podcasts, it could be, you know, for example, uh, a simpler approach than you are currently taking. So looking at an approach that is different, an approach that isn't the same of I'm just going to take as much on as possible and I'm going to hope for hope for the best. I, I think I've heard a saying which it kind of goes like this. Um, you know, ignorance is the definition of doing something or the same thing over and over again, and expecting different results or something like that. But my stepfather used to say it to me all the time, you know, he used to say to me, like, 
If this isn't working for you and you keep meeting the same issue over and over again, maybe look at changing your approach. Um, it could be a work role, which is far too demanding time-wise. So what you get in return for financial benefit is just not worth it. And even then, sometimes the financial benefit isn't even worth, say, a 13 or 15 hour shift. Um, if you are working particularly long hours, it is important that you have a complete separation from your work life and your personal life. And of course, you're gonna, going to have to have a very tight structure and routine on your work days, which will feed back into the planning of your structure and routine for this to be feasible and sustainable long term. Human beings are creatures of comfort and sometimes we get used to the circumstances and yes, even becoming a victim of them, which leads us to believe that we have no choice but to continue on that path that we have always been on. If you are spending every day stressed, overwhelmed and overworked, this is a continual recipe for disaster and something has to change. Otherwise, you are literally just giving in to your circumstances and admitting defeat and repeating the same mistakes. If you have had repeated attempts of trying to make it work to no avail, you could be fighting a losing battle. In which case, this is where we need to go back to the drawing board and assess whether or not our lifestyle, personal and career choices are actually sustainable in the first place. How crazy to actually just assess whether this structure, whether this plan, whether this um, path is working for you at all. Changes in personal career and lifestyle circumstances can seem rather daunting in the beginning, but most of the time this is the actual remedy to moving out of a position of burnout. Call it the puzzle piece that simply isn't fitting, okay, and never will unless we remove or change it entirely. But it's oftentimes that fear holds us back from change in life and as a result we can end up repeating the burnout cycle, inevitably, which isn't a solution either, okay. Think of the last time that you made a significant change in your life. Honestly, I'll give you time. Think about the last time that you made a significant change in your life. Did it go as well as planned? Or maybe even better than you'd imagined? And how often has this happened? Did you have fears surrounding the changes before you made them? How many times have you taken the leap to make a change in your life and wished you'd done it sooner and been grateful that you did versus the times that you had regret? Mmm, wild, isn't it? What is your purpose, okay? The next point is, what is your purpose behind goals and tasks? So not just what is my why, why am I heading towards this goal, but the smaller fine print, what's the purpose behind the little nitty gritty things I'm doing? Are you simply completing a task because it makes you feel productive, okay? Or are you actually achieving something? Oh, ouch. Yep, that one hurts me too. Are your endeavors towards your goals drastically conflicting or clashing? This is super common especially with clients who want to, for example, you know, build muscle and burn fat, like, you know, trying to achieve both of those simultaneously, at least very well, is, is um, not always possible in all cases. Um, could you possibly entertain the idea of putting a pause button on one goal and continuing with the other until it's finished, then starting up the other project if they do happen to clash significantly? Think about the worst case scenario if you do give up on a project or at least put it on pause so that you can finish another endeavor. What's the worst thing that could happen, really? Um, and is this more of a hit to your ego rather than considering prioritizing your health and well-being? Mm. These, these are some you know, really like thought-provoking statements. Are you engaging in multiple different endeavors and goals at the same time for external validation? Or is it intrinsically motivated? You know, can you wholeheartedly say that you're doing everything that you're doing right now for you and only you? And if you aren't, You've got to question the things that you're not doing for you. You know, the goals you've got because you want to impress your parents or you want to impress your partner or you want to impress random people on social media. And this is often why we can try and be too many people at once, take on too many roles at once and too many projects at once because we're pulled in all directions. Um, consider the goals that you might have been pursuing for the purpose of impressing other people, right? These are actually the first pursuits that will need to be eliminated. Yep as they're unfortunately fueled by a fairly empty and unsatisfying motivator, and oftentimes we'll see you get to a point where you just don't want to follow that goal anymore. You know, you don't know why, but probably because it didn't start from a great place. Um, the next point is normalizing taking a step back. And I'm going to reword that, removing steps and becoming more focused and efficient. People look at taking a step back as if it is another form of failure, but it is literally just Removing steps and becoming more focused and efficient is the way that I would see a benefit of doing so. 
It's interesting when I discuss taking a step back with my clients. They immediately see this phrase as doing less and being worthless. I would rather view it as removing unnecessary steps and time-wasting endeavors. It's kind of like, you know, um, paddling in, in the same spot over and over again and not going anywhere. That's the way I see it. Um, especially if they are incredibly taxing on your mental and physical health. After all in life, if we do not have our health and well-being, a roof over our heads and the bare basics, what do we actually have? And what are we actually working towards and why? Some of the most successful people in the world have as l few discussions, as little as possible in a day. Richard Branson is a great example. He understands the importance of designating tasks and delegating to his management team and operations teams and he doesn't feel guilty for doing so. Part of taking a step in the direction of working more efficiently is also looking for help and support um, and not feeling, you know, not feeling bad for doing so, not feeling like, oh, I can't do all this by myself. How terrible. Your ego gets in the way continuously and that then leads to burnout as well. No one was ever successful on a solo mission by themselves with absolutely nobody involved in the process of a larger project. If anyone who's achieved anything phenomenal in life ever said they did it entirely alone, there were no lessons learned, no one taught them anything, you know, imagine if they just... I don't know, like somehow achieved a miracle by themselves, which they didn't. Everyone has learnt from somebody else. But would you not think that it would be smarter to go with people? You'd go faster with people than alone. And further, mind you. You will go, okay, further in life or farther in life if you do accept help and support of those around you and possibly even provide support for others in places that you can. As long as it is not a drain on your time and boundaries that you have already uh, stuck to and you've set, which will lead me to my next point, creating boundaries and valuing your time. Probably actually one of the most essential parts of eliminating burnout is this process, um, you know, if, it, it seems fairly simple if you do not function um, in a family dynamic, if you're a single person, you know, it's easy to put up uh, boundaries if you're living by yourself because there's nobody in your living environment. Uh, but certainly in the work environment, it could be more complex. So it is just as essential though for a family member to create boundaries with another as it is to create with friends and colleagues. This includes saying no to additional commitments that you simply know that you can't handle. And that includes with your children and your partner. And um, I know there are probably lots of mums out there that say like, I feel like I'm wearing 50 hats at once. And I've spoken before about this in my own upbringing. And one of the valuable things I learned from my mother was that as a child, I wanted to do everything, right? I wanted to try absolutely everything. But my mother still had boundaries around that. It was like, no, you're not doing six sports at once. You know, she didn't feel like she was limiting me, but she'd say to me, choose something that you really enjoy. If you're no longer enjoying it, we'll change over. And that actually allowed me to stick to something for long enough to invest effort in it and for me to see that direct payoff in something that I had learnt over time. So if anything, it was a wonderful thing being able to do just one or two sporting endeavours um, and not overwhelm myself or my mother and so mum could still get through her studies that you know she was doing. So and still be a mum, still show up. Um, most of the time if we do overcommit, okay, and it does involve somebody else, it's out of a feeling of guilt, not necessarily I want to do so. So overcommitting is lit that's literally the definition is taking on too much that you know you probably can't handle and then feeling bad because you can't handle it. It's very, very odd, isn't it? Um, and feeling guilty for saying no, etc. So this is where these boundaries come in. This may also look like having particular times that you reply to messages, emails, or even take phone calls, okay? So I know this is really hard to show this self-control or even make phone calls, for example, but maybe you reply to emails for an hour in the morning and an hour in the afternoon and you leave it at that. You know, if you think about it, you're gonna get back to them in the morning anyway. You know, you're not gonna have this constant back and forth. People will actually, weirdly enough, respect your time more when you're not available 24-7. Wild. This might seem a little bit fastidious, but you'd be surprised how much more time efficient it will make you with less interruptions and banking your messages to certain time blocks, even with personal friends and family. I know. Um, obviously, in case of emergency, uh, pick up the phone. Of, of course, you're not going to always know, but certainly, like if you know that the phone call is coming from somebody that ah, I don't really want to talk to them right now, it's like it's okay. You don't have. Why do you feel like you have to answer the phone? Um, for example, you may work a sedentary role at work and find that you need to get more activity in, steps in for your day, 
You might utilize the time that you reply to messages when you go on a walk and maybe even some of your phone calls as well. So to be a little bit more efficient. I go for walks and I listen to my university lectures because I figure why am I sitting down for something I could be standing and walking for. And funnily enough, when you walk, you actually absorb information just that little bit better. Remember that you're human. That's my next point. If you're feeling burnt out, exhausted and overworked constantly, this is your body screaming out for a break. Why are you ignoring it? This is not an excuse or chance to push yourself harder and expect that your mind and body will just participate. If you are particularly tired, you need sleep. If you're thirsty, you need to drink water. If you are hungry, you need to eat a meal. These are the bare basic foundations of human function daily. And if you are avoiding these because you want to push on and seem like a hero, the only person that you're affecting is yourself and you're not impressing anybody. In fact, you are not going to work as productively when you are not looking after yourself. It's, it's literally a known fact. Dehydration, lack of nutritional requirements, energy requirements, and sleep will lead to reduced producti productivity, which means you actually achieve less in the time that you have given yourself to do so. So it's really, it's really interesting when people go, oh, I don't have time to eat, and they get really stressed out, and, ah, and I've got all this stuff due, and it's like, cool, if you don't eat, your brain literally works at half pace. Good job, buddy. You've made a one hour job and now a three hour job. It is actually not that complicated to do the bare basics of, you know, of looking after yourself, of listening to your bodily functions. And it's a, the payoff, even when you're stressed, even when you're under pressure, is insurmountable. You have this huge payoff that comes back to you when you look after yourself. You get things done faster, more efficiently, and you don't resent them as much as well. Um, it's frightening to think that by trying to save more time and give back to your work, career, study, you're actually shooting yourself in the foot and dragging out the time required to complete the tasks. So there's where this whole concept of burning out, hustle culture is a form of self-sabotage. You're actually not doing yourself any favors. If you believe yourself to be an intellectual being, a driven person and somebody who is smarter uh, you know, a smart thinker, sorry, and business oriented, one of the most counterproductive things you can do is neglect your health, your well-being, your hydration, nutrition, and exercise requirements. Um, this is as logical as walking barefoot across broken glass because it takes time to put shoes on. Yep, that's how counterproductive it is to not look after yourself even when you're busy. Consider it starting uh, st consider something like starting your day with the correct nutritional needs, sleep and hydration requirements, um, etc. They're actually the essential building blocks for the remainder of your productivity. Sleep deprivation is not a trophy and no one thinks you're a hero if you're not sleeping enough. You are the only person who glorifies this. Seven hours for men and eight for women and yes, even more for people who are training at an athletic level which would constitute five training sessions weekly. And if you are, or more, and if you are a parent or you're sleep deprived, um, one of the best things you can do is reach out for support from your close network, health professionals, etc., in the process of managing your sleep deprivation where possible, but also maybe the cause of such. So what's going on with your child? You know, I've heard from so many parents, every child is different. And that's the interesting thing. They're all going to need slightly different approaches with, with lots of different um, facets of parenting. And I'm not a parent yet, but I'm about to become one. And one of the key pieces of information I've taken away from it all is if you are struggling with something over and over and over again, please don't be afraid to reach out for help because there can be something, something to assist you in that process and make things a little bit easier for you. Um, do not mistake sleep deprivation for the illusion of achieving a higher level of success as it actually produces the polar opposite result. So you know there's people who say, I get up at 3 a.m. and I get my workout done by 5 a.m. and ah. Uh, and I'm this hero, and I'm like, okay, cool, um, that's fine. How much sleep are you getting? Oh, five hours. Okay, have you thought about going to bed earlier or, you know, like maybe the morning sessions just aren't working well? Oh no, because if I get it done in the morning, I just, I feel more accomplished. You know, I feel like I'm getting it done and, and I don't have to worry about it for the rest of the day. That's fine. Are you continuously getting five hours sleep though? Yes, okay, so that session is somewhat obsolete. Yeah, your body's not functioning well during the day because of those five hours of sleep. So, you know, it's not, sleep deprivation is not the definition of success. Getting up at 3 a.m. is not the definition of success, okay? I know some, some very successful people who don't get up at 3 a.m. because they don't want to and they enjoy their life sleeping enough and they are effective and productive sleeping enough and exercising at a time that suits them. 
Hustle culture, okay, is a facade and something to capitalize from. It's a selling point. This is the, this is the next big factor. If you care, um, sorry, if you are careful, yeah, listening to business coaches or mentors in general. So if you really like to um, listen to, to these people on social media, especially, they'll, they will tell you that sleep is for the week, okay? And if you're not achieving something every single hour of the day, then, and then you are not married to your goals, you know, you don't want it enough. If you're, if you're not feeling exhausted, then you're not trying hard enough. And this is one of the worst things to happen to society, to business in general, to business owners, entrepreneurs, even people in managerial roles, because it's telling you that you need to flog yourself silly in order to achieve something notable. And it couldn't be further from the truth. You're not working effectively if you have to smash yourself that hard. You've not figured it out. Okay, and again, that will lead to burnout. And amazingly enough, burnout doesn't see that you can continue going, right? It's usually a health concern of some sort, mental health breakdown, etc., where you actually have to take time off, probably more than what you wanted to. Remember that hustle culture can be sold as a business principle, and the most helpful mentors in your life will actually teach you how to accomplish more, even more efficiently, with less effort and less stress. I don't um, support hustle culture. Um, I do think that, you know, there is a process of simplifying, um, and implementing better business uh, practice that isn't hustle till you die. Think of it this way. Your dream is not becoming time poor. Okay. But to create more time freedom, is it not? If you are currently, uh, you know, engaging in endeavors that are not achieving that, and the end goal in sight does not seem to align with this progression, the approach is faulted. The process is faulted. Are you busy because you're creating more work for yourself? This is the next point. Or because you're actually achieving what you want to. If you find yourself busy all the time for no particular reason, you might just be creating more unnecessary work for yourself. Have you ever met those people who simply say um, to you all the time, I'm just so busy. I don't know where people find the time to X, Y, Z. You may actually be addicted to constantly being on the go and not finding value in doing less, stepping away, etc., from something to give yourself time to clear your mind. Canceling plans. I'm a big, big fan of canceling plans if I'm not feeling well, if I'm not feeling up to it. I'm not a person who flakes on people, but if I don't feel well and I don't want to be social or, you know, for whatever reason, um, I can't make it to an event. I cancel. I go, you know what? That thing coming, coming up in a couple of weeks, I've just worked a couple of weeks straight with all the comps on and everything like that. I just need a bit of a breather. And it is a form of self-preservation. If you really think about it, very little actually requires the urgency deeply to reply to it either. So that's, a, that's another a factor in this is like, we all have created this high sense of urgency around getting a reply from someone straight away. And Unfortunately, as a result, we've become an incredibly stressed out society. If you really think about it as well, the additional pressure to complete a task in a set amount of time or even a list of tasks, for example, can actually make you go in the opposite direction. So it's not just about the urgency to reply, but the urgency to do something now. I have to have this done now. And when you don't get me wrong, you're going to have due dates for university, etc. But when you put pressure on yourself to have something done yesterday, yeah, you can sometimes actually sabotage that process and feel overwhelmed, so overwhelmed with that timeline, that very short, unrealistic timeline that you've given yourself that you don't do anything at all. Sometimes the additional pressure um, sees that you don't prioritize yourself, okay? So you need to realize that, you know, it's not a life or death situation, every single task ahead of you and possibly putting things on the back burner if you need to. Again, this is this normalizing this idea of taking a step back, putting on the back burner, going, you know what? I don't think I can commit to that right now. It's just a bit much. Um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. And you will find that you'll be back. I'm sorry, you'll gain back some of your sanity in return. Yay. So the next point is removing the fear of doing less and replacing it with the promise of life balance and enjoyment. Okay. Try to remove the addiction the addiction to do, 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 go, go, go all the time. And you might actually find that your response to stimulus isn't being overwhelmed anymore. 
you know, you might find that it's manageable now. And that's a good thing. Having a manageable lifestyle is a very good thing. Doing less doesn't mean that you are less. And this is a common misconception. Coming from somebody who used to work 60 to 70 hour work weeks, and I was trying to juggle part-time personal training with a full-time online business, full-time study, I was studying my Cert 3 and 4 in fitness and my certification in sports nutrition at the same time, running a side hustle business, um, in that, and I was running, running a full-time gym as well uh, role. And, and I stepped away from that and I went, oh, I started competing in that season as well, um, like all at once. I stepped away from that and I went straight into PT and online coaching, you know, and I was, I was just trying to achieve too much or saying yes, too much. <clears throat> um, unfortunately, it saw me spreading myself out far too thin and I'm not, I wasn't, and sorry, and I wasn't taking care of myself nearly enough. I wasn't giving enough time to my personal relationships and I was finding I was getting sick and run down quite often. It also didn't necessarily mean that I was making more money that, or that I was defined as being more successful. Um, no one knew that I was working that much. I was the only person who did. Fast forward to today where I have invested in myself um, and my career, which is obviously my online coaching business only. And I wholeheartedly believe that in doing so, I have become a better coach and also a better partner. I'm more available to my target market and clients as a result, and I produce better services and results for them. Giving yourself permission to do a little bit less in order to show up as the best version of yourself possible to what you really want to achieve, right? So, uh, sorry, to achieve what you really want to achieve. Actually, it actually allows you to feel as though that you are not trapped and that you can take time away from whatever you choose to do so with. So, you know, don't create a cage around yourself with your lifestyle because that's where burnout can start to become a reality as well. The next point is practicing self-care. Self-care is going to look completely different from one person to the next. <clears throat> for me, it might look like going for a float tank or going to the beach on the weekend, spending time with my partner, taking my dog to the dog park, having a bath and switching off my phone. Very simple. My self-care is very simple. Reading is another one that I enjoy. Possibly going to lunch with a friend, taking the time to journal or read a book, as I said, on the weekends, that is not related to my study. Sometimes you need to give yourself permission to do something nice for you, whether it's booking into the dentist because you haven't been uh, in years. Here's your reminder. <laughs> I go every six months myself. Never used to, but I do now. Um, or booking into a massage therapist because you've had a tight neck for weeks, you know, but you're putting it off because everything else is just too important. Um, and if you keep using the excuse that you don't have enough time or money to do so, I, you might need to have a look at your time and money as a commodity as well as your health. So, you know, if you don't have the money for this, what do you have the money for? Where is the money going? You know, is it going towards things that are counterproductive for your health? Look at re reallocate, <clears throat> reallocating your resources and of time and money to places that you need the most so that you can get back up and go again at your full capacity. Once you start practicing self-care, you will understand the value of doing so. And until you do, you're not going to see the value in it at all. But until you do give yourself that chance, um, the benefit of the doubt for self-care, you're going to continue to burn yourself out. And that is a simple fact. Burnout is usually self-inflicted. Yep, it's not anybody else's fault and oftentimes a form of self-sabotage, as I've said many times in this podcast, which goes unnoticed by the people on the outside because they see you working hard. Hidden is hustle culture and a driven mindset. Understanding the value of downtime and contributing towards productivity is going to be an essential part of preventing burnout and implementing effectiveness into your life, which means you're going to have to plan your downtime as well. Unless you plan to give yourself downtime, you probably won't. So instead of saying, I don't have time, you're going to have to say, yes, I'm going to make time. I am making time. And if your time constraints come from family members taking up your time or friends or colleagues work taking up your time yet again, this will come down to re-establishing boundaries. So see how it just all feeds back into the same solutions? And structure and routine. Perhaps you might look at exercising at times when you have the support to do so. So not at 3 a.m. like a hustler, but at the time that works the best for your lifestyle. Or look at getting a massage again, um, you know, when you have the opportunity to have the support to do so. So, you know, if you don't currently, and maybe, you know, I'm gonna be a new mum soon, it'll be very hard for me to go and get my fortnightly sports massages, but what I'm going to do is try and organize it so that my partner can be available for the time that I need that, 
that massage. And the reason why is because it's one of my non-negotiable self-care items. Obviously for some people, they're not going to have someone available to do that. But you know, if it is something that you look at in the future for childcare or whatever it might be, slipping in that little hour every now and then makes the biggest difference to your, uh, your mental health. Part of this relies upon you reaching out to your support network and will feed back into the idea of not being afraid to ask for help, looking at resources which can be useful to give you back your time. So these are some examples of how you can reallocate your resources. Might look like utilizing a gym creche, friends or family, a childcare center, getting into a cleaner, sorry, getting a cleaner in once a fortnight to help you out with house chores, or possibly even ordering meal prep meals from a company that takes meal, the meal prep time out for you. It's not that expensive. Like, I think there are meal prep companies that can do your meals for between $10 and $13 a meal. Oftentimes, avoiding burnout requires approaching your life from a solutions-focused mindset, not a problems-focused and mindset and victim mentality. I used to be a person who was a problems-focused person who had a victim mentality, and it is no coincidence that my life wasn't getting any better with that mindset. Not every struggle or complication is going to have a direct solution. Okay, I know that. But there are going to be more efficient ways of managing your uh, lifestyle, time, and career choices. It's just about getting your, giving yourself the opportunity to do so and removing the fear around making the decisions towards this, towards the change. Remember that not everything ahead of you needs to be done first, but sometimes it's a case of slotting in the things that matter to preserving your mental and physical health. Okay, so life is a giant game of... Jenga, right? It's like stacking things on top of each other and pulling them out and making sure it doesn't come crashing down. But maybe I should liken it more to a puzzle. You're putting together puzzle pieces, making sure they fit. You shouldn't be trying to jam them in. And there's only so many puzzle pieces that can go into that artwork. Thanks a lot. Looking forward to doing another podcast for you soon. Bye.